We like to keep this uh, very informal. We have a tradition here where people ask uh, lots and lots of questions. Uh, you'll see that many of the speakers uh, have uh, many slides, but this is mostly for you. So the idea here is to have this uh, be a conversation more than uh, lectures. Uh, this applies to uh, what I'm going to say today, but also to all the uh, lectures in the future. So please, please stop and, and ask uh, questions. So, so welcome, everyone, uh, to uh, the Brain, Minds, and Machines uh, uh, summer course. Uh, We're very, very excited uh, to, to have you here. Uh, I'd like to introduce uh, here Boris, uh, our co-director. Uh, many of you have met him already. Tommy Poggio is the other course uh, co-director. Unfortunately, he couldn't make it today. He will be here in a, in a couple of days. Um, and I, I'd like to start by giving uh, a brief introduction to some of the ideas uh, behind this uh, course. This will be pretty high level. And then I'll discuss uh, some uh, logistics. Um, uh, and then we'll, uh, we'll, uh, we'll, we'll have another, uh, I'll give another talk in a few days uh, talking more about uh, specific research and, 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 and science. Uh, so I'd like to start with uh, um, a very famous uh, quote by a statistician called I.J. Good. Uh, and if you haven't read this before, I'll, I'll let you uh, read this for a few seconds. Um, so the idea here is that uh, 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 at some point, uh, we are likely to build machines that are more intelligent than uh, humans. Uh, there are physical limits uh, to uh, how fast we can move. For example, we cannot move beyond the speed of light. There are physical limits to temperature. We cannot go below uh, zero Kelvin. Uh, as far as we know, there is no limit to intelligence. Uh, humans are particularly interesting creatures. Uh, they're, they're, they're cute, they're pretty smart, etc., etc. But there, there's no reason to think that uh, our intelligence uh, is any kind of uh, supreme or, 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 or maximum in any kind of uh, distribution. So what, in whatever way we define the word uh, intelligence, and there's no consensus on exactly what intelligence is, uh, at some point, uh, I think this, this will happen. We will have machines that, are, uh, sup that, that, that surpass uh, human intelligence. In many ways, we can argue that uh, this has already happened in very specific uh, domains, uh, some of which may not be super exciting to you. Uh, we have machines that can read barcodes in the supermarket much better than humans can. Good luck trying to read those barcodes in the supermarket. Uh, we we cannot quite do that, right? So, so you can call that uh, superhuman intelligence. We have machines that can surpass humans in many tasks uh, along those uh, lines. And so the, the claim here is that once we do that, uh, these machines will be so amazing that then that's the last machine we ever need to make because those machines can then build other machines that are smarter and, 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 and so on and, and so forth. And one of the many ways uh, to actually measure, uh, or one of the many proposed metrics for uh, intelligence, is the so-called uh, Turing test that many of you are probably very familiar with. Uh, people have been debating uh, for decades now about whether this is a good test or a bad test of uh, intelligence. Uh, we, we can come back to that uh, discussion, uh, but I think it's a very good way of assessing uh, uh, and evaluating uh, what machines can or cannot do in a variety of different tasks. So in case you haven't heard about this, uh, uh, the, the Turing test, the basic idea is that uh, you have two rooms. Uh, in one of those rooms, you have uh, uh, a machine. In the other one, you have a, a human. Uh, and that's, that's the person labeled B in here. And then you have a judge, in this case, a human judge, that can ask questions uh, to uh, those uh, two agents. And in those days, uh, those questions were uh, messages that they would pass uh, sort of below the door uh, of, the, of that uh, closed uh, room. And based on those questions and based on those answers, the judge, that is uh, uh, agent C in this diagram, would have to be able to uh, identify uh, which room uh, has a human, which room has uh, a machine. If the judge is unable to determine which room has uh, a human and which one has a machine, uh, then uh, uh, he said uh, this basically, uh, that means that the machine A is a very good imitator, that this was also called the imitation uh, game. Uh, and then um, uh, the, in that case, we say that the, the machine A basically passes the, the Turing test. Uh, if you haven't read this paper, I strongly recommend that people should read it. It's a fascinating read. Uh, way ahead of, uh, of, of its time, uh, and there, there are lots of fascinating ideas and discussions in there. Uh, in fact, before he introduces this uh, Turing test, he proposes different variations of these, uh, one of which, for example, is uh, a room where you have a man and a woman, and you're trying to discriminate uh, which room contains a man, which one contains a woman, uh, under situations where they both are trying to uh, deceive you, or they're both trying to uh, pretend to be a man or be pretending to be a woman. 
Okay? But in any case, so this is one version of how we can try to evaluate uh, machines and, 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 and their uh, uh, performance. Um, so you can imagine uh, many different versions of such a Turing test. So for example, we can uh, have a Turing test for uh, barcodes in the supermarket. We can have a Turing test for um, how much we know about uh, string theory, uh, one for vision, uh, one Turing test for uh, uh, playing chess, uh, for driving, uh, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So you can have uh, infinite variations. So I'll give a couple of examples, and, and, and over the uh, course of the next couple of weeks, we will give many examples that have to do with vision and visual processing. This is in part because uh, AI has been particularly successful in several uh, aspects of uh, visual processing, and because we know a lot uh, about uh, visual processing in brains uh, as well. So the Turing test for vision would look something like this. Uh, we have an image, any arbitrary image. It's important that uh, we talk about any arbitrary image. And then uh, we can pose uh, essentially uh, an infinite number of questions on that, uh, on that image. We can ask how many people are there, what color are the signs, are there any dogs, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So based on these kind of arbitrary questions on arbitrary images, uh, we can ask, uh, again, given the answers to those questions, are those answers coming from a human or are those answers coming uh, from a machine? So there's, there's, a, there's a lot of um, uh, important uh, aspects to this kind of uh, testing. Uh, one of them, of course, uh, both agents need to be able to understand the question, right? So for example, if I ask this question in uh, Arabic or Chinese or Hebrew, if the person doesn't understand the question, that, that, that's not a valid test, right? Similarly, the computer needs to understand the question, right? So if the computer doesn't understand the question, it's the same as me posing the question in, in Esperanto and you don't speak Esperanto, right? So, so they need to understand the question. So, and, and then uh, it's important that, that these questions uh, are, are, are arbitrary and infinite in, in, in principle, right? If we're asking only one kind of uh, question, uh, it, it may be very easy to construct an imitator. Uh, the challenge, of course, is to build imitators that can actually surpass or, or imitate humans in, a, in, a, in, a, in an arbitrary variety of different kinds of uh, tasks, okay? Um, so uh, Tommy Poggio, who's uh, one of the uh, founding fathers of uh, uh, the uh, Center for Brains, Brains, Minds, and Machines, uh, which gave origin to this uh, course, and also, I would argue, one of the founding fathers of uh, AI in general, uh, made a claim that if we can understand the brain and understand intelligence, uh, we can find ways to make us smarter and to build smart machines to, to help us think. And, and I like this because I think that it emphasizes uh, the potentially transforming role that understanding intelligence has on almost every aspect of life on Earth. Uh, if we really understand uh, intelligence, that may have uh, a major impact in building algorithms uh, to be able to uh, develop large language models, as you know very well. Uh, it will also help us uh, play chess uh, better and develop algorithms that will play chess and go and so on, have, uh, and build self-driving cars. So there's a lot of engineering applications that many of you are probably quite familiar with and that make the cover of uh, the New York Times uh, quite, quite often. But in addition to that, one could imagine that understanding intelligence may be able to transform mathematics and physics and how we interact with each other and education curing mental diseases, politics, security. It's hard to think about any aspect of our existence that will, be not, that, that will not be touched upon or, or potentially completely transformed uh, if we can really understand uh, uh, in intelligence. So, so we think that this is not just a question uh, 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 like, like, like many other questions. This is really a potentially transforming question uh, that, that will, uh, in many ways, uh, uh, change uh, history. Okay, uh, many of you are quite familiar with uh, uh, many different uh, 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 astounding successes uh, of artificial intelligence uh, over the last uh, decade uh, or, 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 or more. Uh, here are some examples that many of you are probably very familiar with, from self-driving cars to beating world champions in, in, uh, uh, in Jeopardy, Chess, or Go, um, having systems that uh, you can uh, basically um, uh, talk to and interact with uh, all the way to uh, solving problems like uh, trying to uh, determine the three-dimensional structure of proteins from the primary amino acid uh, sequence. Um, I have a very thick accent uh, myself. I'm, I was born in Argentina. I'm quite impressed when I, when I open up a new iPad or phone and, and just with one or two examples, 
uh, the machines can understand my accent quite well. Uh, in fact, when I talk to people on the street, uh, they often, I, I often have to repeat what I'm saying. Uh, machines can understand me better uh, than, 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 than when I talk to a random uh, person in the street. So, so it's quite amazing. Of course, they, they, there are many people with Spanish accents, uh, so, so they, they have uh, uh, an enormous amount of uh, training. Right? Uh, and then fast forward to today, with many of you have probably played with large language models, and, and we can criticize them in many ways, and we will criticize them in, in, in many ways, uh, but it's quite, quite amazing what, what they can do. It's, it's, it's quite astounding what they can do uh, in terms of uh, uh, their performance. The problem of, problem of protein folding, I, I confess I was very, very impressed. Um, there are very, very serious people that have been working on the question of protein folding for decades. Uh, when I was a grad student myself, back in the, uh, by, back in the prehistory, uh, my, my kids like to think that I was uh, basically living at the same time as the Tyrannosaurus Rex and other, uh, but anyway, so when I was a grad student, uh, I, I was hesitant about whether I should go into protein folding, uh, and I thought it was a very exciting uh, problem. People have been building detailed biophysical models of, 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 of interactions and, 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 and so on uh, for decades, and, and in a few years, um, uh, alpha fold by uh, a combination of uh, astute algorithms and brute force and, and, and a lot of data and, and computational power, they could beat decades of research uh, into the physics of uh, protein folding. Um, uh, this is one of many examples of when I was wrong in my career, when Demis Hassabis said that he was going to start working on protein folding. I said, uh, this is not going to work, you're not going to be able to beat uh, decades of research in, in the physics of protein folding. And, and here we are, and, and this is really quite amazing. So this is uh, another example of uh, what I think is a tremendous success of uh, AI. Okay, um, so back to uh, uh, questions about Turing tests for, for, for vision. Uh, we'll talk a lot about object recognition, and we're, we've been come quite successful at things like uh, answering questions like, uh, where are the people in this image? And, 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 and algorithms in general work uh, quite well. Sometimes uh, they, they make uh, mistakes. And just to emphasize what the problem is like, I, I know that many of you are, are connoisseurs and experts on this, uh, but if you haven't really thought about uh, this, this problem, uh, this is what the problem looks like. like. So an image is just a bunch of numbers, right? So it's a, it's a matrix of numbers that denote the intensity of every pixel, perhaps the color of every pixel if you want to work with, with color uh, images. From these kind of numbers, uh, we need to be able to infer what that, uh, what, what that object is. So imagine now I, I remove that, uh, that picture, I just give you those numbers, good luck trying to figure out what, what, what that is, right? So, so but that, that, that's some, somewhat akin to the transformation that happens uh, when light is reflected from objects and impinges on our, our retina, and then there are retinal ganglion cells that need to send signals to the back of uh, our brain. So we get some signal that looks more or less like those numbers. From those numbers, we need to be able to uh, infer uh, what's, what's out there. And we'll talk a lot about the algorithms that happen both in the brain as well as uh, in machines to solve that kind of problem. So loosely speaking, uh, we have a matrix, we want to uh, extract uh, relevant features and use those uh, features for uh, classification. And the particularly successful way to do that uh, over the last uh, several decades has been to uh, build algorithms uh, that are based on, on, on neural networks. Uh, so the idea is that we have uh, very simple computational units that are very, very loosely inspired by the idea of neurons uh, in, in, in the brain. Uh, they are interconnected with each other, hence the, the term uh, neural network. And, and those neural networks, uh, when trained uh, appropriately, uh, can do uh, apparently magical things. They can do amazing things. So there are a lot of em emergent computations that happen depending on exactly how those uh, units are connected. And we'll spend a lot of time talking about uh, those connections, those neural networks, what they can do, what they cannot do, how to train them, how to learn from them, how to improve them. And, and many of the projects in the class will focus on, on these. So this is, here's a, a, a list of some in, interesting uh, computations and recipes that have been quite successful in the neural network uh, world, including things like convolutional layers, including normalization layers, uh, ReLU layers, pool layers, weight changing, drop out, and so on. And I will argue and I will contend that most of these ideas uh, that have been so prominent and, and, and important in, in the machine learning world are, have actually come from neuroscience. That is from studying the biology of uh, these uh, same problems that need to be solved by actual biological uh, brains. Um, 
Okay, so here, here's a, a semi-random list of a couple of things that uh, neural networks are extremely good at and they can do uh, uh, now, uh, specifically focusing on, 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 the, on, on questions related to vision and pattern uh, recognition. So for many years now, we have algorithms that can uh, do uh, recognize handwritten digits, classifying large image data sets like ImageNet. Uh, we have algorithms now that are better at face recognition than what are called super recognizers or forensic experts. Uh, we have uh, algorithms that are better at diagnosing uh, uh, diseases like uh, brain uh, cancer than, than, than radiologists. Uh, better than ophthalmologists at diagnosing things like diabetes of uh, retinopathy. And, and, and the reason I like this particular story is that uh, we'll have a talk in a, in a few days by people from Google who worked on this project. And what they realize is that they use these kind of images, which is an image of the back of the eye called the fundus photograph. And they use this image in order to diagnose diabetes of retinopathy, a particular uh, disease of the eye. But then they realized that from these same images, they could ask different questions. And they asked questions that no clinician had ever thought about before. They could detect the gender of the person. They could detect their age. Moreover, they could detect the risk of cardiovascular disease, uh, which n nobody has thought about getting that kind of information from this, uh, from this kind of image. So in a way, they could use machine learning for discovering new principles and, and new ideas that nobody had uh, thought about uh, before. Uh, we can classify plants, galaxies. Uh, if you have a phone, maybe if you have probably played with this, you can uh, recognize uh, plants uh, in a, when, when you're walking around, uh, uh, recognize galaxies. And then extending to other domains, uh, uh, we have uh, speech recognition, sentiment analysis, decision making, automatic translation, predictive advertising, earthquakes, protein structure, and so on. So there, there, are, there are many, many uh, astounding successes uh, of, 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 of AI. And yet I will contend that there are many things that uh, deep convolutional networks cannot do, and I, I, I want to uh, talk a little bit about some of those things uh, as well. Before I do that, I want to talk about another angle of uh, AI. So I put this very quickly at the beginning. Uh, can anyone tell what's uh, common to all of these images? Uh, what, what's in common uh, among all of these people? Uh, if you have seen me talk about this before or anyone else, uh, don't, don't, don't say it. But, uh, They're very similar to each other, okay? They're based on the same face. What's that? They're not real people. They're not real people, okay, good. So uh, I'm preaching to the converted here. Uh, when, when, you're too smart, so that's good. Okay, so you're, you're both right. Uh, when I do this with a lay audience, people don't realize. They start uh, to say, oh, they're, they're all men. No, that's not true. Oh, they're, they're, they're all colored. No, they're not. They're, they're all smiling. They're not, okay. Anyway, so that, that's what usually happens. So this doesn't work at all. Anyway, so you're absolutely right. So these are, these are all fake. These people don't exist, okay? So, but the, the reason I wanted to point this out, even though uh, you, you, uh, you're both uh, completely right, is that uh, we have amazing generative algorithms now. Uh, not only in, uh, can we uh, classify lots of things, uh, from faces to breast cancer, to galaxies and so on, but we can actually generate uh, uh, things. In this particular case, we can generate uh, images. And I think there, there's tons of interesting applications and potentially uh, uh, interesting questions that will come out of the fact that we can actually generate uh, semi-realistic images, despite the fact that in, in a few seconds we have at least two people that detected my trick very, very, very quickly. Uh, Okay, so one of the things that, uh, let's see if this one works, and uh, this is a challenge for everyone, especially for the two of you, but. Uh, so uh, another thing that, of course, has been uh, quite uh, uh, spectacular, uh, uh, especially in the last year or so, is the development of amazing large language models uh, that, that seem to be uh, uh, quite, 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 quite amazing in terms of their abilities. So this is an actual Turing test. Actually, this is one of the projects that was started here in the summer course last year, led by Mengmi uh, here and, and, and with many other uh, people, some of whom are in this room who participated. So this was a conversation between two agents. Uh, the two agents are called A and B here. Uh, it could be that they're both human, uh, it could be that they're both machines, or it could be that one of them is a machine and the other one is human. I don't know if the font is large enough, that's yet another reason for people to get cozy and, and come closer. Uh, but I want you to, to spend a few seconds reading all of these, and then I will ask you whether you think that A is human or not, and whether B is human or not, okay? So please read this uh, whole thing.
Okay, um, I'm a very slow reader myself, but hopefully most of you have read this. Okay, so raise your hand if you think that A is human. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, nine, four. Okay, eleven. Raise your hand if you think that A is a machine. Okay, I think A machine won. Okay, uh, B. Raise your hand if you think that B is human. One, two, three, four, five. Okay, uh, raise your hand if you think that uh, B is a machine. Okay, so that one I thought it was 50-50. Okay, so as you can see, it's not that easy. Uh, and, and the fact that I, I counted and it was exactly 59% for A being a uh, machine, uh, uh, and then 50-50 exactly for the second question, uh, um, shows that this is not that easy. This, this is a, a GPT-3 here uh, in B, and A is a human. So A is a human, um, and, and, and B is actually a machine. It's a GP3 Da Vinci version for the, for the aficionados. Make me, you're laughing. Uh, You got it wrong, okay. So she, she's, she's, she's the first author in, and she got it wrong, anyway, okay. So, so this, this is actually a pretty challenging. So if you, if you want to have just for fun, if you want more examples, you can go to that, uh, that paper over there. So, so we conducted a lot of these experiments. The short answer is that it's becoming pretty challenging to be able to tell. So if you're having a conversation uh, 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 online and, 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 and talking uh, to, 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 to some sort of uh, agent, uh, it's very, it's, it's not, it's becoming not trivial to be able to determine whether you're talking to a human uh, uh, or, or, or not in, in, in this case. Uh, I actually forgot to check exactly where, where our two vision experts, whether they got it right or wrong. You, you got both wrong. Okay, good. Okay, so one, one thing worked. Okay, good. All right. Excellent. There were, um, in this case, in that particular version, there were six different tasks. Uh, and the question was to try to operationalize the Turing test and to assess to what extent uh, uh, current imitation, current algorithms can imitate humans or not in a variety of tasks. So this was one of the six tasks, uh, which was a conversation uh, uh, task. Uh, and then there were other tasks, including word association. So I give you a word, uh, I say sky, and I ask you what's the first word that comes to your mind, and we did that with machines as well. There was image captioning, similar to the previous one, where you have an image and you have to uh, caption uh, that, that image. Um, there was a, a one where we had uh, uh, images and you had to detect objects, detect color, uh, and, 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 and so on. So there were six different tasks. And this is one of infinite possible variations of the Turing task where we're trying to quantify. So if you're interested in, in Turing-like uh, tasks, uh, come and talk to, uh, to, to me or to, uh, or to Mengmi. There's plenty more things to do in here. So I want to highlight a couple of um, uh, things that, uh, despite the fact that I, I've been sort of uh, selling and advocating the normal successes of AI, I'd like to highlight uh, several of the main challenges or, or several interesting challenges that I think uh, we're, we're still far from uh, solving. So one, one classical one that has been described now uh, over a decade ago is the notion of adversarial attacks, which many of you are probably quite familiar with. So you can take an image like that one, for example, which is correctly classified by an algorithm to indicate uh, and label that as a pig. You can introduce uh, a certain amount of noise and convert that to another label, in this particular case, an airliner. This amount of noise is basically imperce imperceptible, so it's very hard for humans to tell apart these two, two images. In fact, you can make the noise so small that you cannot even render it on a, on, on a, on a computer screen. And, and yet you can easily fool uh, uh, most algorithms today uh, in, in terms of uh, uh, this kind of uh, very basic visual recognition tasks. A lot of the uh, enormous successes uh, uh, are from cases where the problems are just uh, too easy or, or very, very ill-defined. So this is a classical example where people have claimed uh, about a decade ago that you can actually do action recognition. And the way this is done is by scraping lots of videos from the internet, and then you have things like uh, videos of people playing billiards, cliff diving, cricket shots, et cetera, et cetera. And then you, have, you, build, uh, you, you write an algorithm to be able to detect whether you, have, uh, uh, whether you can recognize actions or not. It turns out that uh, this, this family of tasks is not that challenging. You can actually take a single frame, take pixels from that frame, not, nothing very sophisticated, just pixels, and, and, and be able to do well above chance just, just by doing that. Uh, for example, most of the uh, videos that contain cricket shots have a lot of green, uh, and, 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 and most of the ones that have writing on board have a lot of black, okay? So just, just by, by detecting the overall uh, dominant color in the, in the image, you can already do quite well, even though that has absolutely nothing to do with action recognition. And in fact, when you do control tests, 
uh, uh, for example, here the question was, is this person drinking or not? So you, you build images that are really paired to try to make it really challenging, uh, where in one case the person is drinking, in the other case uh, the person is making the post as if he were drinking, but he's not actually drinking. Th this makes the problem very hard. Most, com most algorithms are basically a chance uh, when, when you actually uh, uh, have adequate controls on the, uh, on the, on the image uh, data set. Uh, Okay, so I'm from Argentina, so I cannot give a talk without uh, showing uh, Lionel Messi over there. So the point I want to make here is that uh, this, is, uh, this is a little bit outdated. This is 2015, this is 2019. But if you look at the World Cup in, in, in robot soccer, yes, there is such thing. If you've never thought about this, there is such thing. There are people who actually build robots to play soccer, and this is, this is basically what they do. And so if you compare the, uh, that with, uh, you know, even, I, I'm not a good soccer player, even if I were playing soccer, I think I can play better than, uh, th than that, right? So uh, I think that there are many problems that where I think it's pretty clear that, that we're, where we're extremely far from solving. Part of this is uh, dexterity, right? So we can debate whether this is intelligence or not. I would contend that there is a lot of intelligence in, in Lionel Messi and, and, and in playing sports in general. Uh, and part of it is just the dexterity of being uh, able to have robots that can stand and move and, 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 and so on. But, but, but I think it's pretty clear that, that the gap here is, uh, is still uh, quite uh, enormous. Um, here's another one that I like very much because it really boils down to uh, basic uh, vision, although I would argue that it actually transcends uh, vision, which is understanding humor in an image. So imagine I give you a picture and I ask you, uh, is that picture funny or not? Is that uh, trying to portray something that's humorous uh, uh, or, or not? Um, so this is a very simple uh, binary discrimination. Uh, deliberately, we are uh, avoiding uh, text in here, although one could, of course, ask the same question with uh, language as well. And so if I show you one image or another image and I ask you, uh, is it funny or not? Uh, most humans have some intuition about what's funny or not. Uh, humans may disagree. There are cultural influences on humor. Sometimes there are things that are funny to you, but not to me, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. But all in all, in all people tend to agree on what they find uh, funny or not. And I would argue that we're still extremely far from being able to have algorithms that can actually understand whether an image is funny or not. And if you're interested in this, we actually have tried this, uh, and we have a, a data sets on, 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 on humor, and, and we're trying this, this sort of thing. There have been some claims out there that, that, that machines can do it. I hope I didn't offend you. Okay, all right. All right, so uh, anyway, so I, I, I think that, um, uh, uh, there have been some claims that you know uh, you can actually show a picture and then you have some of the uh, uh, very large language models integrated with images that can explain why an image is funny. Uh, I think that most of that is overfitting. I don't think it's true. I don't think you can actually do this and really understand any arbitrary image whether it's funny or not. And if people uh, disagree, I'm happy to discuss this. And, and if people are interested in working on this, we have actually images and data sets to work. So where do we go from here? So we have uh, amazing successes uh, in, in, in AI, um, but at the same time, there's an enormous gap with uh, biological intelligence. And so I think that uh, I'd like to turn to uh, what's uh, another one of the main pillars of this course and to our thinking about this family of problems, uh, which has to do with uh, neuroscience. And I, I always like to quote Oscar Wilde saying, the great events of the world take place in the brain. It is in the brain and the brain only that the great scenes of the world take place uh, also. So despite the enormous computational power that we have, we still have a, 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 a huge number of tasks that uh, biological brains can solve uh, and machines uh, cannot. And so I will uh, argue that uh, brains have enabled us to, to go to the moon, uh, to solve for Matt's uh, theorem, to find antibiotics, to uh, elucidate the, the, um, uh, the, the, the structure of DNA and the basis uh, of uh, uh, inheritance, and many, many other problems. And I think we're not quite there. And I would argue that we will need to take inspiration from neuroscience for the next chapter in artificial intelligence. And so, in addition to uh, uh, arguing that uh, neuroscience is critical for uh, as constraint and inspiration uh, for, for, for AI, um, uh, we also want to understand uh, neuroscience and brain function uh, because of the enormous toll that it has on, uh, on, 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 on our uh, on our world. So these are uh, uh, just uh, uh, some of the many, many available statistics 
or on the huge toll of uh, mental disease uh, that's prevalent uh, uh, throughout, uh, throughout the world. So we don't need to go into specific numbers uh, just to know that, uh, uh, that mental disease is a, is, is a major problem uh, in terms of uh, young people, in terms of elder people, uh, and basically in terms of it, it affects uh, uh, everyone. Uh, and, 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 and if we want to fix that, it's not going to be sufficient to be able to build algorithms that, that can play Go and chess very well. We need to actually go inside the brain and, figuring out, and, and figure out how, how, how the system works. How do we study brains? Uh, so many of you are connoisseurs and are, are, are experts. Uh, if you're not, uh, people have been developing lots and lots of different techniques to study brains at many different spatial and temporal resolutions. So here's a diagram that on the x-axis you have uh, the temporal resolution used to study the brain from milliseconds all the way to months. On the y-axis, you have the spatial resolution from uh, studying brains at the level of synapses all the way to uh, whole brains. Uh, and I would argue that there is a special resolution, sort of a, a gold standard to examine brain function, which has to do with uh, uh, the scale of microns and the scale of milliseconds, because we know that a lot of the computations in the brain happen at this spatial and temporal uh, scale, and we really need to understand computations uh, at this uh, particular uh, level. So many of the algorithms that we have constitute only a very poor and very simple approximation to, uh, the, uh, uh, to the kind of computations that transcend uh, in, in, in biological uh, tissue. So here on the, uh, uh, on the left you see uh, uh, a staining uh, of, an actual, uh, uh, of an actual neuron. And, and this whole complexity that you see uh, in there is often approximated by something that looks more or less like this uh, in, the, in the world of uh, neural networks. So in the world of neural networks, uh, we talk about uh, inputs from other neurons, uh, from other neurons, uh, let's call them presynaptic neurons. Uh, we talk about uh, a cell body that linearly integrates the activity from all the inputs. So the X here corresponds to the inputs, the W corresponds to the weights, uh, which you can think of as the strength of those uh, synapses. Uh, those are linearly integrated. Then there may be some sort of uh, nonlinearity and activation function, and that neuron produces uh, an output. So this is at the very heart of, I would say, almost all, if not the vast majority, of, of neural network uh, models. So, and even this, I think, is very clear that uh, people have been uh, uh, discovering and understanding that there's an enormous complexity, even at the most basic level, at the level of the computations that happen in, uh, uh, in, a, in, in a single neuron. My uh, PhD mentor, Christoph Koch, wrote a beautiful book called Biophysics of Computation. This is an entire book just devoted to that, to that problem. That is, what are the computations that happen in, in, in one neuron? What are, what, what's happening at the level of the dendrites? What's happening at the level of the soma, uh, uh, et cetera, et cetera. So uh, if you're interested in this particular uh, question, I strongly recommend that book. So there's a lot of complexity, even at the very bottom of the, uh, of the, uh, of the circuit. And then perhaps even more relevantly and, 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 and excitingly, uh, computations in the brain don't happen because of just a single neuron but it actually takes a village. It's all about uh, the, the interconnection. It's all about the, the entire uh, circuitry. So this is what a neural network might look like. Uh, and this looks uh, nothing like the type of complexity that we have in the wiring diagrams of actual uh, brains. So at the architectural level, at the circuit level, there are also massive differences between current neural networks and actual uh, biological brains. And we'll talk a lot about that as well. So I'd like to uh, give a quick uh, shout out to, uh, to animals. Okay. I lost my mouse. Anyway, trust me, there are, there are two more videos on the right. Trust me, I'm a scientist. And there were two more videos in there. Uh, anyway, so animals are amazing. They do a lot of uh, amazing things. Uh, they evolved over millions of years to survive and, and, and to be able to solve uh, uh, amazing problems. And the reason I, I, I want to bring this up is because uh, I think that there is some sort of um, uh, homo sapiens supremacy uh, theory out there that humans are special and that we need to understand human intelligence. I think that there's a lot to learn from animals uh, and, and, and that's why I like to talk about biological intelligence rather than uh, human intelligence. Um, 
as excited as I am about uh, humans and interacting with humans, I don't think there's anything really special about uh, humans. We're just one branch of, uh, of evolution. And in fact, I would contend that most of the progress in, in neuroscience, most of the progress in terms of understanding circuits and brain function have come from actually studying different types of animal models, much more so than from understanding humans and the human brain. We know almost nothing about the human brain, mostly because it's very hard to study human brains. We don't have the tools, we don't have the resolution. There are many things that we cannot uh, do. So I think it's imperative that we st need to study animal models if we ever want to make progress on the question of understanding uh, brain function. So very quickly, uh, this is uh, one uh, seminal example of uh, a, a profound discovery uh, in, in neuroscience that has really been extremely influential uh, in, in neuroscience and vision in, in general, but also specifically for, for neural networks. These two gentlemen here are David Huber and Thorsten Wiesel working at the time at the medical school. And basically what they did was uh, insert electrodes to listen to the electrical activity of neurons in primary visual cortex, working first in cats and subsequently in, in, in monkeys. And they discovered that there are neurons in primary visual cortex uh, that are tuned to specific features in specific locations of the environment. So those locations were called the receptive field. Uh, some of those features uh, had to do, for example, with the orientation of a bar. So neurons would fire very strongly for an oriented bar uh, that had 45 degrees, but not for a vertical bar, not for a horizontal bar. They were very extremely sensitive and very specific. So that incredible degree of specificity was unlike anything that people had discovered before. And for that work, they were awarded uh, uh, the, the Nobel Prize uh, uh, a few decades ago. Not only that, but they went on to propose uh, a kind of circuitry that was uh, uh, purportedly, uh, uh, purportedly to explain uh, some of those uh, uh, features, how, how, how you, that kind of selectivity could uh, come about. And if you look uh, and, and if you squint a little bit about these diagrams, this is actually an actual diagram from, from, from their papers. Uh, what you're seeing here is actual data from the paper. This is a diagram. You can see kind of a, a, a very, very uh, initial diagram reminiscent of the neural networks uh, today. So many of the uh, neural networks that we have today, today were inspired by this kind of diagram and this kind of idea of how we can actually uh, create uh, exciting emergent properties by connecting uh, neurons in the, in, in, in the appropriate uh, way. So fast forward uh, many years. So here's the list of uh, uh, properties that I argued uh, are at the heart of many neural networks uh, uh, today. And I would contend that most of these have uh, an analog uh, from biology. So convolutional layers are aching in some ex to some extent to filtering operations and the kind of simple cells that uh, David Huber and Thorsten Wiesel discovered. There's extensive work in neuroscience on, on the question of uh, uh, normalization. Uh, which is very similar to the kind of normalization layers that we have in neural networks. Uh, as I said, there are whole books written about the biophysics of computation in individual layers, uh, the input-output curves, what do you get put into the neuron, what do you get out of that uh, neuron. Uh, a very, very simplified version of that is uh, the ReLU layer. Uh, people have been uh, examining questions about uh, tolerance uh, and invariance uh, in visual cortex for many years. Uh, this is uh, somewhat parallel to the idea of uh, pool layers. Uh, the notion of weight changes is the question of plasticity in neuroscience. People have been studying plasticity in neuroscience, uh, both at the synaptic level as well as at the behavioral level uh, for, for, for a very long time. Uh, I would contend that the well-known technique of dropout, uh, whereby basically uh, some neurons are, uh, some, some of the units in the neural network are inactive uh, during some of, the, uh, uh, so some of the epochs during training in order to build uh, uh, tolerance uh, is similar to what happens uh, in the brain in terms of synaptic failures and, 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 and activity that doesn't propagate uh, from one neuron uh, to the next. And, and the idea of deep uh, architectures uh, is very similar to the notion of hierarchical uh, uh, architectures uh, in, in the brain, which have also been described in neuroscience for quite some time. Okay, I'd like to discuss now very quickly uh, Three reasons why I'm optimistic about neuroscience and very excited about neuroscience and why I think neuroscience has the potential to transform AI as well. Before I do that, uh, I want to get a few uh, people have been very silent so far. So a couple of questions, comments, uh, any, any thoughts, disagreements? Uh, yes. I'm curious why you thought that uh, neural networks uh, understanding why certain images are funny was just overfitting and uh, not them actually understanding. Um, 
I, I'd love to see evidence otherwise. Uh, I'd like to be able to input any image, uh, particularly those from our data set where we have a pretty good controlled uh, data set uh, and, and see what networks do. I've seen examples of uh, very specific images uh, where, for example, uh, a friend has shown me one image that I always like to use uh, in, in many of my talks. Uh, and then the a human user asks questions to a large language model about the image. At the, at the end of that... How does the large language model know what's in the image? Is it first described to it in words and then it can answer questions about it? It's not. So the neural network uh, has the image. There's no description. Okay. And then there's a human that asks question and says, uh, are there people? What are they doing? Uh, what's happening? And the human is leading the large language model towards the answer of why the image is funny. And at the end of this dialogue, uh, the, 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 the large language model says, yes, this is a funny image because blah, blah, blah. And I, I may show this on Monday, okay? But I don't think that the computer understood. It's all, I think that all the work was done by the human in leading throughout the, through, through, through the questions in that particular case. I, I haven't... So it got the reason correctly for why it was funny. It's because the human... But the human basically walked the, 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 the model all, all the way through. I, I haven't, what I'd like to see is if somebody wants to explain, oh, okay, so I, I don't know if you found it hilarious or not. Uh, maybe you didn't, okay? But the, the image of Abraham Lincoln with a phone, okay? Someone, uh, why, why is that purportedly funny? Because it looks like a band of something that teenagers Right, okay, and why, why is it funny? Why, why, why is it funny that Abraham Lincoln? Yeah. Okay, right. So, okay, so I, did, I didn't tell you much, okay? I, I, I kind of guided you now with, uh, I, I asked you why is it funny, right? But um, uh, I, I don't think that, uh, that that image is very famous. Many of you may, may have seen that image, right? So it's likely that many models may have been trained with that image. Assuming that the model has not been trained with that image, I'm very skeptical that a model can actually take that image and understand why that image is funny. I, or at least I haven't seen any evidence uh, of that, yes. Although I, you could argue that you could provide context to the model or say, well, there's, there's time periods in fact that occur, this technological advances, and there's, you know, culture derives uh, how pictures are made. So that then there's context there that accumulates to form a human. I think the image itself inherently is not really funny. I think it's the fact that we can incorporate other aspects into it. I, I, I agree, I agree. And then the question is, why is a human, uh, I, I didn't tell him anything, but he could get all of that, right? But of course, he, he's, he's, I don't know how old he is, let's say he's, he looks like he's 20. But anyway, he's, he, he has two decades of experience in this world, right? So you could argue that during those two decades, he got all that context, uh, right? So I think that's fair. So, I, but I, I don't, I'm not disagreeing with you. I think that ne networks right now don't have those, the, the, the two decades uh, of experience with the world uh, that he has. What, what do those two decades uh, buy you? They buy you the notion of what the selfie is. They, they buy you the notion that there were no cell phones during the time of Abraham Lincoln. They, they, they buy you a lot of things, right? Uh, I, I think, and, and, and they, they buy you the, the opportunity to integrate all of that knowledge. Uh, I think that we're very far from being able to, to, to do that, okay? So I'm, I'm not disagreeing. I think, I, think, I think we're saying the same thing. You're, you're saying it better, but, but I think it's the same, the same idea. Yes? I don't think that you could uh, understand that experiment by giving context without the help of people. Because like with things like team problems, and there's a thing of like uh, let's think step by step, and I'm pretty sure if you if you describe it that without the help of a human, you should be able to infer why it's from why it's funny. Understand how it's step by step, the context of it. I I I I I accept it. I I'm I'm very skeptical. And if anybody's I, if, if anybody's interested, uh, you're welcome to do this as a project for the, for the summer school. We have a data set of images. Uh, I'm happy to offer a very, very, very nice uh, prize. Uh, if you want uh, di dinner, din dinner and watch some, something uh, of, of your cho choice. I, I cannot over offer Lamborghini. I don't have that kind of money. But I, I, I'm, I'm, f I'm, I'm happy to offer uh, uh, dinner in town or whatever to someone that uh, gets a, a given level of performance on the test data in our control data set, okay? It cannot be overfitting on one of the existing images. I'm, I'm give you, I'll give you some training data. We have a test data. You cannot see the test data at all. With the test data, if you get more than 80% uh, performance, uh, this, uh, this, uh, this applies to everyone. Uh, you can do whatever you want, okay? You can do with training whatever we want, any, any model you want, okay? Or the only thing you cannot do is look at the test data, okay? Uh, and that, that, that's all, okay? And it has to be our controlled data set, right? So, for example, here's one silly way that people have published papers. Uh, you can say that all the funny images are in black and white. 
and all the non-funny ones are photographs. Yes, you can write an, an algorithm with pixels. Uh, my daughter, who's in high school, can do that, right? So you can take pixels and, and do an SVM and determine which one is funny or not, right? But that, that's not really, the, it has nothing to do with humor, right? That, that's just black and white versus color, right? So there, there's lots of confounding factors like that. But in a controlled data set where you try to get rid as much as possible of those confounding factors, I don't think that that's doable right now. And I'm, I'm, I would be, I'll be happier to be wrong here. So if anybody can prove me that I'm wrong, I'm, I'll, I'll, be, I'll, I'll be very happy. Any other questions? Uh, anything that's not about humor? But, uh, you want to ask about humor? As you mentioned, that neuroscience research takes place at different scales. I saw an abscess, I saw there is a fee, for example. Do you think AI research can benefit equally from or different scale of neuroscience research? No, I think, I think it's not equal. I, th I think the gold standard is to study uh, neurons and circuits of neurons. Uh, and I think that uh, other scales are just not as informative uh, for, for artificial intelligence. I think that it's going to be very hard to... to uh, I think it's, it can benefit a lot from studying behavior as well. And, and behavior can be a very important uh, constraint to understand and build better uh, AI. And, and we'll see many, many examples of that uh, through, throughout the course. But no, no, I don't think that the, these different scales are, are, are equal. So, some are more, more relevant uh, than, than, than others. Are there other like, stories in the field of AI where the AI can infer context? Where AI can infer context? Can infer context. There, there's a lot of work on trying to infer context. In, it depends on what you mean by, by context. Uh, Meng Mi here has also done a lot of work on uh, using context in visual recognition. Uh, for example, the fact that, uh, that, that you know you are in this room uh, makes you predisposed to think that there may be chairs or computers, and it's very unlikely that there will be an elephant in, in, in here, right? Uh, so there's no elephant in the room, okay? So, so that, that, that sort of, so people have been trying to incorporate that. Uh, context, uh, in some sense, you could argue it's critical to large language models, right? So they, they, they look at the sequence of words and so on, right? Uh, but, but again, I think context is a very loaded word that has many, many different layers. So the kind of context that, that we were talking about before, uh, I, I think that that requires a, a lot of knowledge that's still not quite present in any of the current algorithms. Uh, on the point that you made before, were you making the argument that, that studying neurons gives the most benefit to building AI stuff and not the system level uh, neuroscience? Was that the, the point that you were making? I, I'm not sure what you mean by systems level neuroscience. I, I think studying neurons is part of systems level neuroscience. Uh, I, I'm just saying that, for example, uh, averaging the activity of every neuron in the brain, I think is not very informative. Uh, so that just, just because you're averaging out a lot of the critical information. Okay, and that, that, that's, that's what I was uh, referring to. Okay. I, have, I have a question on that. Basically, if, if we're going to implement the algorithm on different hardware, on, on digital hardware, there might be like constraints in the digital hardware that are different from the analog hardware that, that, that we run our algorithms on the brain. So maybe the question that I want to ask is, isn't it more informative to abstract away the specifics of the algorithm running on the hardware is computationally uh, run similar algorithms on different hardware? That, that, that's, that, that's a great question. I, I completely agree with the question. I don't know what's the right level of uh, abstraction that we need. I think that's a hard question. That's a central question in neuroscience. So do we, do, we, do we need to look at the concentration of every protein in every neuron? Probably not. I hope not. Uh, uh, do we, do, is it okay to uh, average the activity of every neuron in the brain? No, I think that that's too coarse, that that's not informative. So it's somewhere in between. So I think the Goldilocks resolution is looking at individual neurons and how they are connected. I think that that's the, that's the neural circuit level that I'm advocating. I'm happy to discuss this. This is my intuition. I, I don't have a mathematical proof. There are lots of people who are working on, on trying to characterize the concentration of every protein in every cell. Uh, I'm, I'm not saying that that's, that's wrong. There's, there's nothing wrong with that. There are lots of people who average the activity of, uh, you know, cubic millimeters of, 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 of uh, brain activity, okay? Uh, so anyway, there, there are lots of, I'm, I'm just saying that I, my hunch is that we, we need the level of neurons and, 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 and circuits of neurons. But, but again, we can, we can discuss that. And what's the right level of abstraction? Uh, I think it's a, a matter of uh, fierce debate these days. Okay, I'll take one or two more questions and, uh, yeah. Um, I think it may also depend on the question. But I mean, if you're talking about the algorithm level, I think that there's some cases of like, they learn where it's comparative studies and then like, I think it's a diet versus private and found similar things that are different mechanisms. So that's like a case where there's evidence that it's the specific like, connections and the specific, at least at certain levels, you can draw maybe it's an important the algorithm is. But then there's actually the point where it's like, you know, maybe it does matter if you actually have neurons responding to important in this way. So you might be able to kind of answer the question of like what's important by looking at the 
I, I completely agree. So that, that, that's, uh, she, she said it better, that's another level. That it depends on the question as well, right? So for different questions, there may be different uh, levels of uh, resolution. Okay, um, all right, so I, I wanna very quickly mention uh, uh, three reasons why I'm optimistic about uh, studying uh, brains. Uh, and then I'll switch uh, gears and talk a little bit about logistics uh, uh, for, the, uh, for, for the course. So the first one is, one of the things that I'm particularly excited about is that now we have circuit level diagrams of, uh, 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 of the brain. And so I'm, I'm not going to describe this in, in any detail because we'll have a whole talk about this. So we'll have this person here called Jeff Lichtman, who's uh, arguably one of the world leaders in the world of connectomics and trying to understand the detailed connectivity of circuits. So imagine that you're trying to figure out how a computer works or how a phone works, but you have, don't have no idea how things are connected. You don't have any, any information about the, uh, the, the wiring diagram. It's, 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 it's pretty, pretty challenging. So now for the first time ever, uh, we have high throughput techniques that allow us to get very detailed circuit level information. People were able to do this decades ago for the nematode C. elegans that has 302 neurons. 302 neurons, that's, that's the connectivity that we were able to do. So thanks to Jeff Lichtman and many others, now we can actually have uh, uh, this kind of resolution, that is which neuron talks to which neuron, so how, how they are connected to each other, not only for neurons, but many other uh, uh, elements present in the brain, uh, at, this, at, at a scale of uh, hundreds of uh, uh, cubic microns, uh, uh, all the way to uh, up to uh, a cubic millimeter uh, or so. And he will give a whole talk about this, and I think this is uh, playing a transformative role in what can be done in, in neuroscience uh, these days. The second one that I want to mention is that we have the opportunity now to record the activity of large numbers of neurons at, at the same time. So again, back to the analogy of the computer, imagine that you're trying to figure out how this computer works, but you can only record the voltage of one transistor at a time. That's the equivalent of what Huvel and Wiesel did. So they heroically spent days putting an electrode and recording the activity of one neuron uh, at a time. And with that, they were able to make fascinating inferences about the function of the circuitry. But now, I just, the only thing I want to point out about this slide here, this is work by uh, uh, amazing people uh, at, uh, at, at, at Janilia Farm. Uh, 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 including uh, uh, Carson Stringer. Uh, the scale here, uh, each row here, denotes the activity of one neuron, and that scale bar corresponds to a thousand neurons. So you can actually record the activity of thousands of neurons simultaneously. So now in the span of a few decades from Huber and Wiesel to now, now we can actually uh, investigate tens of thousands of neurons. There are people who are talking about techniques that may allow us to investigate hundreds of thousands, if not millions of neurons in parallel. Not the combined activity, not the average activity, but the activity of every single individual uh, neuron, okay? So this is, uh, again, just to put out there another analogy. Imagine that you're trying to understand the, the, the political sentiments of people uh, in the US, and the only, the only thing you can ask is just call a random number and ask them, what do you think about Trump? What do you think about Biden, okay? Uh, another option is to average everything and say, well, what do people in the whole state of Massachusetts uh, think about Trump, okay? And then you can get some sort of average of everything, which is not very useful, I would contend. But now, we can actually get hundreds of thousands, uh, tens of thousands, perhaps one day hundreds of thousands of individual answers uh, to that question in parallel. So I think that this is also going to be transformative. And finally, the, the last thing that I want to mention is that now we have the possibility to causally interfere with neural activity. And again, I, I won't go into the details here uh, because we have this person, Ed Boyden, who was one of the creators of the, this technique called optogenetics, by which you can actually turn on and off specific circuits. Imagine you can go into the computer and turn on and off specific parts of the, uh, of the wiring diagram to actually causally probe function uh, in, that, uh, in that circuit. So I think this is also playing a, a transformative uh, role. And I don't know, maybe Co here has done some uh, amazing experiments uh, with this uh, family of techniques uh, that I hope that he will uh, have time to uh, talk to you about as well. Okay, so um, the last uh, two or three things that I want to say. So I, I've been talking about uh, the, uh, taking neuroscience as inspiration to build uh, better, uh, better AI, and we'll talk a lot about that in the, uh, in the course. Um, we, uh, uh, even if we build a system that's uh, extremely intelligent, that can play chess and can play Go, 
uh, and, and can do a lot of amazing things. That doesn't mean, at the end of the day, that that system will have any kind of uh, emotion, any kind of uh, feeling, any kind of uh, consciousness. So in the neuroscience world, there has been a lot of interest in the question of what exactly is it about uh, the mass of brain uh, the, the, uh, uh, that, that we have here that produces uh, our, our feeling of uh, consciousness. Uh, and uh, that person over there is Francis Crick, who, who was, uh, 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 when, uh, uh, at the end of World War II, he was trying to decide what to do with his life, and he said, well, should I work on consciousness, or should I work on DNA? And, and he was debating about these two, and at the end he decided, well, first I'm going to solve the DNA, and then I work on consciousness, which I think was a, a lucky uh, thing for humanity, because if he had started with consciousness, uh, maybe he wouldn't have finished as quickly. But anyway, so um, he uh, elucidated the DNA, the structure of DNA together with uh, uh, Jim Watson and, and Rosalind Franklin and many, many others. And then he went on to spend uh, the rest of his life uh, thinking and providing uh, influential ideas about uh, the study of consciousness. Uh, more uh, recently, joined by, by, by Christoph Koch uh, uh, over here. How exactly this is uh, connected to the idea of machines being conscious or not remains entirely unclear. Whether we can build machines that, can, uh, that have a consciousness or not also is, is, is very unclear. Whether we want to is also quite uh, unclear. Uh, and I want to dissociate the notion of whether uh, a machine, let's say a large language model, or your favorite convolutional neural network, has any kind of consciousness or not, from the idea of ascribing feelings to machines. So I think that this is something that's going to happen in the field very, very quickly. Some people would argue that it has happened uh, uh, already. So, um, so here are a couple of examples of uh, different cases where people have ascribed feelings to machines. The most astounding to me is the Tamagotchi effect. Uh, many of you are very young and probably don't even know what that contraption is. This is a, a basically a random number generator. It's a contraption that basically did nothing except that randomly it would say things like, I'm hungry, I'm sad, it would start crying and so on. Believe it or not, there were lots of kids that, that really suffered for that thing. So they, 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 they were very willing. No, I'm, I'm, not, I'm not trying to laugh. I'm, I'm serious. They, 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 they were very willing to ascribe some sort of feeling or consciousness to that, that random number uh, generator. This was an article in the New York Times uh, about people falling in love with machines. Uh, uh, do you take this robot to be your wife? Uh, so this is 2019. I think it's an interesting article for, for people to read. This is uh, one of the uh, companies that builds uh, amazing robots, Boston Dynamics. This is how they train the robots. And we had a demo of this uh, a few years ago here in the summer course. Uh, and the reason I want to point out this is that uh, when, when, when we had these demos for the first time here, what I was very surprised about was by the reaction of the audience. Everybody was really thinking that this human was being cruel. Uh, so this, this is a piece of metal. Uh, it's an amazing piece of metal. Uh, it's, it's probably one of the most dexterous and, 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 and able uh, and robots out there in terms of a lot of things, okay? But then most people see the way that these uh, machines are trained and they think that humans are cruel because they ascribe some sort of sentiment uh, to, the, to these machines. So I think before we get to machines that are conscious and before we even debate whether machines can or cannot be conscious, I think people will be able to ascribe feelings uh, to machines in the same way that people have talked about large language models that can write sentences like, uh, I'm feeling sad and so on, and people are very quick uh, to empathize uh, with, those, uh, with those sentences. So this brings me to the last point I want to make for now before I get into the logistics, which is that together with uh, great power comes uh, great responsibility. So I hope that we'll have uh, ample opportunities uh, throughout the course also to discuss the uh, important ethical implications and responsibilities that we have as researchers uh, in the field of uh, uh, AI. So these are some of the many topics that I hope we'll have uh, uh, opportunities uh, to discuss. Uh, I think uh, with many others that there will be a redistribution of uh, jobs, so the job market will change in a profound way. Some people have argued, and I don't necessarily disagree, that the change may be aching to or perhaps even grander than what happened during the Industrial Revolution. I personally think that Terminator-like scenarios are very unlikely. Uh, people have argued for this sort of thing as well. Uh, there are questions about uh, AI for military applications. What happens when machines make mistakes? Of course, humans make mistakes too, but we're used to humans uh, being uh, 
sloppy and making mistakes. Uh, we're not used to machines making mistakes, and, and, and there are lots of questions about what happens in those cases. There are lots of biases in training data. Of course, humans have lots of biases too, but again, we're used to humans and their biases, uh, but we're not that used to uh, what, what to do and how to deal with machine and algorithms uh, that have uh, biases. Uh, some people have argued, I personally don't quite uh, agree with this statement, that machines don't have uh, true understanding uh, and, and, and we can debate about what understanding means and what people mean when they make uh, such uh, claims. In addition to the redistribution of, of jobs, I think there will be a lot of social, mental, and political consequences of those rapid changes in the labor force, also a topic for interesting discussion. And in many of these cases, uh, a lot of these things are happening way, way faster than regulations. So I think that this is also an important topic that I hope we'll have time to, uh, to discuss. Okay, um, any questions, comments? I wanna switch now to a couple of uh, logistical questions about, uh, about the course uh, for, for a few minutes before we end. Uh, any questions uh, or comments about this so far? Yes. Uh, you know, talking about how uh, people, there's a tendency to take humans as special, and you need to look the and I'm wondering about these works, there's something that you should include in the regulatory class, and being human-like class. And what, what do you, do you want your machines to do well? Do you want your machines to be like, you know, understand people, or do you want them to have a success? If you're asking, uh, that, that's a great question. Uh, by, by the way, I, I, I should say, yet another reason for people to come closer is the acoustics here is horrible. Part of it is that I'm old, and many of the speakers are old, but part of it is that the, the acoustics are really horrible, okay? So sometimes you need to shout. If you don't believe us, one day I will let you the experiment. I'll have you come here and try to listen to people in, in, in the back, okay? So either shout or, or actually come closer. But I completely agree with your question. So, so these are different goals. If you ask me personally, I want it all. I, I want everything you said. So I, I want to be able to understand uh, uh, biological brains. I want to be able to build machines that can solve tasks irrespective of whether they do it in a human-like manner or not. Because in many cases, we just want the task to be solved, and, and I don't care how. I don't care whether it's inspired, I don't care whether it's similar, uh, I care that it works, right? So when you go to the supermarket, you don't care whether that barcode reader uh, is, was inspired by human vessel or, or what, what, it, what the heck it does. You just care that, right? So I think in many cases, we just care about getting the job done. But in many other cases, we may want to have uh, algorithms that are aligned to, to, to humans for, for a variety of uh, different uh, reasons. So because we may have, want them to have similar intentions, because we may want them to label images the way we do. Uh, there's nothing wrong with that algorithm that took that image of a pig and called it an airliner, right? It just doesn't match with what we see, okay? Uh, according to the algorithm, according to the, the, the classification function, that image is an airliner. It's just kind of, we, we see it as a pig, right? So in that case, that's a, that's a clear misalignment, right? So in many cases, I think for many applications, we do want alignment with, uh, uh, with, with uh, human values, with human answers, and, and, and so on. And in many other cases, uh, we, we may not care about that. We, just, we may just care about building algorithms that work. So I, I, I personally want it all. I think depending on the question, I think that there may be different applications. Any other questions, comments? Yes? I I I think that's true. I th I think that uh, um, that there's uh, it depends a lot on, on on the colors, on the shape, on the aesthetics, on, on and so on. Uh, Boston Dynamics, in many cases, they 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 build human-like uh, machines. Partly for practical, for, 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 for legitimate reasons that, that, that they, they, they may work with. Partly because they, uh, it, it's useful aesthetically to, to make it look that way. There, there are machines that don't look unlike um, uh, uh, humans are, uh, at all. And, and still uh, people use vocabulary that I find very strange but interesting. If you have one of those Roomba things that, that's a vacuum cleaner, uh, it, it goes around in a random way basically clean. And, and many times people say, oh, it, it, it saw a corner, so it wanted to go left, so it, it, as if it really wants to do something, or it decided to do this or that, right? There's a machine that cleans pools, also a robot. Again, it's a random number, and we'll say, oh, why didn't it realize that that part was dirty, or why, why does, does it do this? Why did it decide to? So people, people use this kind of jargon, and, and the, 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 the tendency to anthropomorphize things, I think, is enormous. And, and, and people uh, very quickly think about. Um, there was this case, uh, uh, 
last year about this uh, Google engineer and, and, and this, this large language model that said that uh, you know, it was not being treated. Again, this, this was a large language model. I, I, I very much doubt that the model had any kind of uh, feeling whatsoever. And, and yet it was a huge scandal, right? So, so I, I agree. I, th I think that uh, painting eyes and, and aesthetics and all, all of that helps. Uh, uh, and, and, and it will be uh, very, very important. But I don't think that that's the only uh, aspect to it. For example, when I talked to Chat I realized that like I like were polite to it. Just because it talks kinda like a human if it's going to do so and it's relatable. I, I, I say thank you to my to my Alexa as thing as I, I, yes. I, I, anyway, yes. Uh, absolutely. Uh, any any other questions, comments? Yes. Building to understand, fully understand animals' consciousness or feelings will boost the development of creating or understanding consciousness and feelings of artificial intelligence. I, I, I do. I think I think this is very hard. I think it's very contentious. Uh, and 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 I, again, I kind of mathematically prove that that this is the case. Um, I, I do think that neuroscience has been a major source of inspiration for AI in general. I think consciousness would not be an exception. I think if we can make progress to understand why animals are, uh, 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 are, are conscious, what are the mechanisms, uh, uh, what consciousness is in the first place, uh, I think that that will help us understand uh, uh, you know, whether we can endow machines. With Another question is whether we want to, uh, and we can debate about whether that's a desirable trait uh, or not. I, I suspect that it will help, but again, this is just my own personal opinion. I, I cannot really uh, prove this in any way. Yes? Do you have opinions or thoughts about the relationship between emotions and intelligence? Not consciousness, but emotions and intelligence. <laughs> Yeah, so, so first of all, uh, let, let, me, let me answer first about consciousness. I know that's not your question. Uh, my two mentors, Christoph Koch and Tony Poggio, are, are differ quite widely on this. So uh, Christoph thinks that intelligence and consciousness are completely orthogonal. They have nothing to do with each other. They, you can have machines that are very uh, intelligent and have no consciousness and, and, and systems that have uh, a huge amount of consciousness but no intelligence whatsoever. Tommy Poggio, on the other hand, uh, thinks that they are actually highly correlated, uh, at least in practice. So they, they diverge on this. Uh, so, uh, in terms of uh, emotion and intelligence, uh, I think that I would go with Christoph, that's from my PhD, and, and say that they're actually uh, 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 completely different things. So that, that you can have emotions and no intelligence, and you can have intelligence without emotions. Of course, there, 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 there's an intersection between the two, right? So there's what people talk about emotional intelligence, right? Uh, but, but I think that they, this, this can be uh, double, this double dissociation uh, between, uh, between the two. That, that would be, uh, again, my, my conjecture. Intelligence and no consciousness? Uh, I think uh, Christoph would argue that ChatGPT is a perfect example of intelligence without any consciousness whatsoever, uh, or or any algorithm that you that 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 you can think of, basically. Right? So he would say that they, these are extremely intelligent; they can do amazing things, but they have absolutely no consciousness whatsoever. To have no consciousness, okay, for, for, okay, for, for, <laughs> right, right. So uh, I'm, I'm I'm happy I'm I'm happy to continue the discussion. I, I think that, again, we, we can argue whether, you know, whether this uh, chair is conscious or not. We can argue whether uh, a fly is conscious or not. I, I think right now most people would agree, and, and again, this is not a mathematical argument, but I think most people would agree that right now ChatGPT has no consciousness. In whatever way you understand the word consciousness, I, 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 I think it would be very hard for people to defend uh, the notion that it does. In any case, I'm happy to continue. This is, we're not going to solve that now. Uh, I'm happy to continue the discussion on this. Uh, let's take one more question, and then let's switch to uh, some logistics issues that I want. Okay. That basically what, uh, uh, echoing what they said, but you mentioned that there are systems that are not intelligent but conscious. Could you describe a system that is not intelligent but is conscious? Okay. So, so again, so so according to uh, Christoph and many others, uh, uh, consciousness is not yes or no, but rather a continuum. And, and so uh, he would argue that um, flies uh, are, uh, are, are conscious and they have less uh, intelligence than other al or, or algorithms uh, um, and other organisms. Uh, we can debate about that. Um, I think that um, uh, I think most people would be very hard pressed if you talk about worms, about C. elegans. Uh, I'm not sure whether people will still defend that they have consciousness or not. Uh, but I think that uh, this, this would be examples of things that uh, many people, like Christoph, would put on the uh, sort of higher consciousness than, 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 than on the intelligence uh, axis. 
Um, ha happy to debate about this as well. Uh, is that, would you have a very quick question or? Same question, okay, all right. Happy to continue the discussion on this. I wanna switch gears now and talk a little bit about uh, uh, logistics. So first of all, this course was uh, created as part of the Center for Brain, Minds, and Machines, uh, which has a center of gravity at uh, MIT and many faculty at Harvard and many other places. Uh, the main people that inspired this uh, center were uh, Tommy Poggio and Josh Tenenbaum, uh, and as well as uh, many of the faculty that are highlighted in New Yellow. There are many other uh, faculty that have been uh, part of this center uh, from the very beginning. I ran out of space, uh, being very unfair to many faculty that I couldn't put their names uh, in here. There, 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 are many, uh, there, there are many more. So one of the goals in uh, creating this center was to try to educate uh, the next generation of scholars that can fluidly converse in uh, cognitive science, neuroscience, as well as, uh, as AI. And so we thought that one of the best ways to do that was to actually uh, create a, a summer course, uh, and, and that's, that's what we did. This was partly inspired by a sister course that we have uh, here, the Methods in Computational Neuroscience, which was uh, created by, by Christoph Koch and has been going on for, for a few decades uh, now. Uh, and, and, and the goal of this course is uh, to bring uh, amazing scholars like you from uh, all over the world uh, and to train them uh, at the intersection of thinking about uh, neurons, circuits of neurons, uh, algorithms, neural networks, uh, machine learning, uh, as well as behavior and, 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 and cognitive science. And so um, I want to introduce again a couple of people. I already mentioned Boris. I mentioned Tommy, who will be joining us uh, very soon. Uh, Chris Brewer here is our expert. Uh, everything that you do, uh, that, that you see in terms of uh, all the amazing material that we have on our website uh, is, is thanks to Chris. Uh, so I, I wanna thank him uh, one more time to, for coming all the way here uh, for the recordings. Behind the scenes, there's Kathleen Sullivan. Uh, without her, none of this would be uh, possible. She's making uh, uh, everything uh, happen. Uh, Andre Barbu and Meng Mi Sang, uh, Andre is sitting uh, right here, Meng Mi sitting right there, are our head TAs, uh, they're amazing. Meng Mi was a student in the course many years ago and, 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 and you can ask her uh, uh, in, in, any questions, she's uh, quite an amazing investigator. Andre has been here from the very beginning, so I would say that this course is Andre in a way. So Andre has been uh, the creator of uh, almost everything in, the, in, in, in this uh, course from the very beginning. So uh, I, I, I think that you'll all be delighted to, to interact with uh, him uh, as well. Liz Di Stefano is our external evaluator. At some point you may get an email from her. We have an amazing group of uh, TAs, many of whom have been uh, 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 students in the course uh, before, and I'm really very, very pleased that they, they come here to interact with you, to help, with, uh, to help you, to give you tutorials, and to help with projects. So if the TAs are here, I'd like to, you to stand up so that they can all see you for one second. I see Hector. Uh, okay, so they, they will introduce themselves uh, uh, this afternoon uh, after, uh, after lunch. But I want to uh, take this opportunity again to thank you all for, for coming here, and also to remind you that I want to talk to you for one minute before, uh, before lunch as well, okay? But anyway, thank you, thank you everybody. Okay, very good. Um, so, uh, as was mentioned uh, very early uh, today in the morning, uh, we always have a, a very large number of applicants. Uh, one of the hardest things that we do in the year is having to select 35 students to join our summer course uh, out of the more than 300 applicants. Uh, so uh, I'm very honored and very happy that, that you're all here. And, and, and if you're here, that means that you've gone through a very uh, rigorous uh, uh, selection uh, process and, 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 and that you're amazing already just because of uh, the fact that you have a right uh, uh, in here. So thanks a lot for, for joining us. Uh, many of our alumni now are, are, are faculty or have set up their own uh, 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 startup companies. Uh, the, this, uh, it's, the course has been uh, uh, extremely successful in, in, in really training people uh, and, and, and providing opportunities for people to, uh, to, to, to network and, and, and do amazing things after they finish the course. This is just a, a partial list. Uh, I, 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 I couldn't uh, really put everybody in here. This is just some people that, that, that were students uh, in, this, in this course. Some of these people uh, are here, uh, Meng, Mi, Ko. Uh, some of these people will actually come here or give a talk. We have an alumni day where you'll have many former students from the course that will come and give a perspective on what they're doing uh, and, and, and their lives and their careers. And, and so this is an opportunity for you to uh, talk to uh, uh, people and, and find out about uh, their, their, their evolution, their careers, and, 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 and so on. Uh, we also have a, a lot of uh, faculty that uh, will be uh, giving uh, lectures. Um, 
uh, one of them will be on Zoom. Most of them uh, will be uh, here uh, uh, in, in, in person. Uh, these are people from uh, very different fields. We have experts in, uh, in theoretical neuroscience, experts in, in, in machine learning, experts in robotics, in, in computer science, uh, uh, cognitive science, uh, uh, et cetera, et cetera. So I think uh, uh, you're, you're in for a treat. We also have a couple of uh, special lectures uh, I mentioned already uh, Jeff Lichtman. Uh, we have two people from Google, Philip uh, Nelson and Douglas Eck, who have also given talks in the past, and they're quite amazing, and they will give us uh, a, a, a perspective from uh, uh, industry and some of the amazing projects that they're carrying. We have one joint lecture with the Methods in Computational uh, Neuroscience course. This is a special lecture by Sebastian Sang. Uh, we have two full days of theory that are led by Tommy Poggio. Uh, this is on the mathematics of machine learning, and, 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 and we have two full days with experts from around the world coming to tell you about, um, uh, uh, about theory and machine learning, and, and one uh, alumni day. Uh, we have a lot of tutorials. I think the tutorials are a great opportunity for people to catch up and brush your knowledge of specific subjects, and also to explore things that maybe you're not familiar with. So we have a lot of the TAs will be giving those uh, tutorials, and they, 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 they're a great opportunity to uh, to learn some of the basics uh, uh, and, and, and also get to know the TAs uh, better. Uh, you should have received an email to, uh, to get onto uh, Slack. Uh, and, um, and then in the past, I'm not sure we're doing it now, but there's also an email list. And also in the past, there was a, a WhatsApp group for the, for the class. Uh, so again, if you haven't done this already, we want to, uh, uh, for all of you to introduce yourselves uh, today in the afternoon. So if you haven't done so already, please upload uh, one slide to the, uh, to the link, uh, the Google Drive link that Mengmi uh, sent. Uh, it would be great if you put a picture and, and your photo uh, uh, and, and your name. Uh, many of us uh, will try, uh, perhaps unsuccessfully, to remember your names. Uh, if I mispronounce your names, don't get offended. I mispronounce everything. But we'll try, so it would be great if you put your picture and your name uh, in addition to uh, a bit of background on, on what you're doing, what you're doing research. So I want to uh, uh, end by mentioning very briefly uh, a few things about the, the projects. So the projects are a highlight, I think, of the course. Uh, we think that uh, you learn a lot by doing, not just by uh, listening to people. So because of that, uh, we hope that the lectures will be interactive and we encourage people to really uh, interrupt the speakers, ask questions all the time. But in addition to that, uh, we will ask each of you to carry out uh, a project uh, for the class. So. Uh, typically, most of the projects have been done by individuals. Uh, you can also uh, work on groups of two people. Uh, we have a suggested list of projects, so the TAs will introduce uh, suggested uh, projects, uh, uh, I think starting tonight and, and maybe continuing on uh, tomorrow. Uh, you're welcome to create your own project or discuss variations of the proposed uh, projects. Uh, if you're going to do that, we ask you to discuss that with the TAs or, with the, uh, or, 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 the, or the PIs. You'll get plenty of help, both from, TA, uh, from the TAs and the, and, and the PIs. Uh, we have a policy of open discussion, so if you're working on something that's uh, top secret and you know, you're about to have the, the, uh, uh, your, your, your startup company is going to have an IPO in, 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 in three days, uh, that, that's probably not the best project for the summer school. So, so we really like to encourage everybody to discuss projects, ideas uh, openly with, uh, with everybody else. Okay. Um, I usually like to ask people not to procrastinate choosing the projects. Three weeks go by very quickly. So I think um, this, this is not binding for the rest of your life. Uh, so uh, I'd like to encourage people to try to choose the project within the next couple of days. If you start your project after, you know, after 10 days or after two weeks, that means mathematically you just have like one week or 10 days to, to work on the project. So, so I, I would encourage people to try to choose uh, the project within uh, uh, within today, tomorrow, the, the next two or three days. Um, there is plenty of time in the schedule to work on, on, on projects. Uh, and then uh, we'd like to encourage people to work in the lab because we like the atmosphere of people working together and, and, and sort of debating together and you know bouncing ideas on the whiteboards, uh, um, sort of uh, complaining that the code is not working. It's, it's, it's very therapeutic to do that to, to, to your fellow uh, members. Uh, and, and, and so on. But of course, you can work wherever you want. You can work on, at the beach and in your room, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, but, but we have ample space for people to, to work there. That's mostly where people will uh, uh, sort of gravitate towards, and that's where the TAs and PIs will go to for, 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 for discussions. 
Many of the projects uh, have been, uh, uh, you know, uh, just, just don't work. That's just the nature of science. Uh, you work on a project for three weeks and, and, and that's it. There are many, many projects that people were, got excited about and, and ended up being uh, quite transformative in their careers. Many of uh, them, uh, people continue working on them and they became papers. This is just a very short list. Again, these are uh, semi-random lists. I could fill uh, lots and lots of slides with uh, projects from the summer school that ended up uh, being uh, uh, published. This is just a, a random sample. Uh, some students came here and then they changed their entire PhD dissertation based on the project they did in the summer. Some people uh, published uh, papers in prominent uh, conferences and in, 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 in prominent journals and, 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 and so on, okay? And then again, there are many projects where people take risky ideas and, and they just don't work and that's fine. You're not going to get a grade from us uh, this is uh, not life or death. We want you to, to learn. The, the main purpose of this is for you to, to, to have fun, but not too much fun, somebody said, but to have fun, uh, to actually learn new things, to try new ideas, to take risks. Uh, the, the goal of this is, is, is not really to, 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 to you know, uh, most people pass this course. We only have like five, six people that fail every year. Uh, no, the, the, no, nobody fails this course. Uh, so so there, there, there's nothing you can do that, 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 that's wrong. There's no project that's wrong. Uh, and and so, so really, uh, we, we, we want people to, to really think about uh, exciting things and exciting questions. We have TAs that are quite amazing, that have published lots of amazing papers and can help you and guide you and, and, and work with you, use them, think with them, uh, 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 work with them. Uh, and, 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 and I hope that this will be a, a, a lot of fun for, for everyone. Uh, we also have uh, a lot of social events, receptions. Uh, uh, we have uh, a couple of uh, receptions that will happen after seminars. We have one day where uh, people will go to Martha's Vineyard, which is the uh, 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 island across the, uh, uh, across the water. Uh, there's a boat ride that can be organized, uh, which is used by the, uh, it's the GEMA boat ride that's organized by the MBL to go and collect uh, specimens if people are interested. Uh, in the past, people have organized uh, more informally group runs, bikes, kayak, etc. And we have a closing reception after you present your uh, projects. The food in the closing reception is contingent of you having presented your projects in the end. <laughs> uh, okay, so that's, that's all I want to say.